Ladies and gentlemen, would like to welcome you to this seminar organized by the Gulf Studies Unit at the Arab Center for Research and uh, Study Research under the title Discourse on the Qatar 22 World Cup Power Politics and Aspirations in which we shall resume the unending discussion which is hosting the FIFA World Cup 2022 in the state of Qatar and its actual organization of such an event which is the most prominent uh, sports event in the world. This discussion shall continue for uh, some time now and it has uh, moved from being a technical and sports discussion into political discussion as it represents many values and um, stances and positions and this expands the discussion on this cultural and ideological uh, discussion. Qatar FIFA World Cup 2022 is uh, just another event in sports arena. It wasn't simply a sports competition, it has other uh, technical aspects and the intense discourse that surrounded such an event cannot are inseparable. The discourse is what gives it a voice and gives it a meaning. In the late 60s, uh, the, f the French, um, uh, the French um, um, in intellectual published a study that in such a book uh, he he flipped the tree of relationships with the humans in symbiology and language studies. As explained in, in, in a book published in the second decade of the 2021, as he explained that linguistics is a, is a discipline that language will become a part of a broader is a broader discipline called semiology. Semiology is a branch of linguistics not the other way around, because there is a communication that doesn't require language except for small communication channels and Barth explained and proved uh, this uh, through an empirical um, uh, research. All the drawings and models doesn't, uh, cannot exist without language. The thesis proposed by Barth in this book says that language is not merely a mean of communication, just like any all other systems. It exists in everything and gives meaning to things. This seminar stems from the importance and significance of the Qatar FIFA World Cup and its success and its records in terms of spectators and viewership. The importance of this of this uh, Mondial or FIFA World Cup is its symbolism and that the discourse surrounding it is of such importance uh, and uh, many stakes are um, um, in the manifolds of such discourses and it was full of meanings and symbols and insinuations more than merely a sports events. And then the seminar would take a subject from linguistic symbols and um, formal and informal during and before the uh, event, uh, which is big part of such meanings is associated with the balance of power that that was um, uh, fighting over uh, sports, and uh, specialists in such a discipline thought that sports are a part or a mean of soft power. The discourse that dealt that dealt with the FIFA World Cup is stems from international relations, and the main question is, why would a country that is designated as a small country to organize the FIFA World Cup, and what does it seek to achieve from such organization? And this uh, this comes in line with literature that start that try to interpret Qatar's foreign policy, a small country such as Qatar that lacks hard power and large population or um, geographical area has resorted to soft power. Qatar might have, uh, might, might have expanded the, um, the discipline of small countries and their influence and uh, a study to understand the, the Qatari model 
So therefore, we are before um, uh, two models that open to discourse and media as it constitutes the content of soft power, our national identity. And we believe that the organization of such a competition has superseded such frameworks for their details. However, they have produced an interpretation in a particular historic era. Now, it's not only limited to explaining why such a small country attempts to organize such a huge or significant event. However, such um, uh, a competition has become uh, part of a broader um, um, of a broader fabric and it's not it's not Japan nor Korea nor Mexico nor South Africa but is the other that some in American intellectuals wrote about which is um, an, a cultural foe or enemy to the West this is the fabric that Qatar was part of and the and the Qatar FIFA 2022 was organized by the state of Qatar as an organizer in a promo of a TV program broadcast uh, by a Saudi channel based in Dubai, covered the event on a daily basis. An Egyptian old woman asked the host, and, and she asked whether Messi was coming or not. The question was not about whether Messi would participate or not, but rather would he come or not. Such a discourse that the manufacturers of such promos and non-residents of Qatar who haven't been part of the organization felt that uh, the, um, the event is organized on their homeland. And the and, and the, uh, the Arab uh, thought system has overcome uh, such models that was prevailing at the end of the 19th century. However, the discussion now whether we are partners in modernity or not, or is it a um, multitude of uh, modernities, if you want to use the, the phrases of Herbert Qatar's organization has intensified such an issue and crystallized it and phrased such an a controversy this seminar seeks to go beyond what the literature has tackled when analyzing um, the the linguistic um, analysis despite that awareness of symbolic behavior and discourse that express these two um, the frameworks, this seminar seeks to explore the questions that tackles the actual organization of the FIFA World Cup Qatar. And the symbols and the meanings through such an organization to represent them, revisit them honestly and to explore other frameworks and other dimensions from which the discourse emerges identity, north-south relationship, uh, centrality, um, cultural multiplicity or diversity, globalization and universal culture, etc. Such meanings are not a, are, are not um, uh, a post event but it's part of the event and this seminar doesn't want to shift away from the sports studies as we believe that this this problem is part of the seminar that contributes to deeper understanding of the event and the discourses around the event there are very rich literature and studies in sports that tackles all these concepts at particular depths. This seminar aspires uh, to explore the frameworks on sports studies and the accumulation of literature in this discipline through a new empirical um, uh, study and this way this seminar is aligned with the sports studies by using sports as a tool to understand multitude of social of social uh, aspects. I apologize for the long introduction. I leave the mic now to Ms. Reem Al-Ansari, who is the host and the moderator of this session. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Rahman, for these opening remarks. As is usual, we would like to welcome the first uh, sessions uh, uh, panelists, uh, which, 
our speakers today, Mr. Hans Honstad, Richard Giulianati, and Mr. Joel Rockwood. In the first session, we will uh, have Mr. Hans Honstad's uh, presentation. He is uh, an anthropologist and uh, he uh, runs uh, a uh, center for research on football and he f his focus is on uh, uh, peace and development, uh, culture and other aspects and uh, and Dr. Richard is from Lovebra University, and he is an associate field chief editor of the Journal of, uh, of uh, <coughs> Research and published. He has more than 20 books to his name, and his books and articles were translated into 15 languages. We start with Mr. Hans Hostag and Mr. Richard could not attend in person. He will be, Mr. Hans will join us via Zoom application. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, are you able to see the slides? This okay? No. Okay. Yes, uh, as you can see, Richard couldn't make it uh, due to sad circumstances um, in his family. So uh, I'm doing this on my own. Uh, initially, Richard invited me to uh, to join me uh, as he had been invited by Doha Institute to, to give a presentation on uh, the Qatar World Cup and soft power mostly, and, uh, and then he invited me along because I was part of a group, a uh, research group. We did uh, ethnographic observations during the World Cup um, uh, for 10 days. So that's the background, and, and this is very much, a, what shall I say, work in progress. Uh, so, um, so it's going to be more empirical, uh, more sort of uh, observations. Uh, but based on the rhetorics which sort of preceded uh, the whole uh, tournament. Um, so I'll start by giving, um, this is an image from uh, Al Bayt Stadium in Al Khor, by the way, so, um, uh, which also introduces you know, the topic of our research project, which is about football and religion in the Middle East, uh, uh, where we try, uh, this is funded by the Norwegian Research Council, <clears throat> Um, and um, um, the, the topic is, uh, you know, looking at um, various sort of intersections between um, um, Islam uh, mostly and and football in, in the whole Middle East region. You know, from and we by Middle East we include Iran uh, in, the, in the east and Morocco in the west. So it's it's a, uh, and, and the Gulf region as well, of course. Um, I'm not going into detail. You can see for yourself here the the, the basic um, um, provisions for 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 the project. Um, but we, in order to give you a, a, a sort of um, uh, outline, we can. Um, I would I would like to um, present you know the three analytical fields from which we operate. Uh, the first is a, a sort of mostly ideological and you could call it theological discourse between you know, on, on, on football and religion. Um, it's, um, it's led by uh, one of um, one of the team members, which is Bjorn Wolof Ludwig, who's an expert on Islamism, uh, first and foremost. Then we have um, a look at local organization of football, uh, physical education and physical activity, which will be led by Charlotte Lisa. She, is not yet a full-time member of, of, of the, um, the group. She will join in June. Whereas me and Doug Tuesta, we uh, share a, a focus on spectator culture, including media and social media, and you know, how 
how is football portrayed and, and uh, mediated? Uh, so Sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see the slides. Your slides can. No, no. Why is that? Okay, let's. Uh, you can only see me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, can you see this? نعم. الآن نستطيع الرؤية. نعم. Is it okay? Thank you. I hope you can see this. Um, I was talk taking you through some of the, you know, outline of the uh, of the project, and um, um, I'm not going to go into um, great detail about this. I am the manager. I'm the project manager of, of this field, and I come from my background is anthropology and sports studies. So I'm mostly from studies previously on transnational identities, um, mostly fan, fan identities, globalization and identities. Um, and my most recent works has been on you know, stadium and stadium architecture, which is also relevant, of course, with the, with the construction of the, of the stadiums for the World Cup in, in Qatar. Um, regarding methods and, you know, for the whole project, uh, project as a whole, apart from apart from Qatar, we we've already done studies in uh, Saudi Arabia. I, I forgot to mention, um, apart from our team previously, we also have a PhD student, uh, Kyra, uh, who I think is with us. Uh, she will do um, a study on physical education and and women in uh, in Saudi Arabia from from August. So. Saudi Arabia, apart from Qatar, Saudi Arabia is included. Iran, Palestine, Morocco, and possibly Lebanon or Syria uh, will be next year. Um, the methods we, we use is mostly ethnographic, but we've also done the conducted surveys. And, and other work so far include interviews with female footballers in Iran, just prior to uh, when the riots started in September. Um, uh, we have a, a survey in Gaza. Uh, we did a survey in Gaza in uh, November, during the World Cup, actually, um, uh, asking people about, you know, connections between religion and uh, or religiosity, <laughs> or the intensity in in the religious life and and uh, how how this relates to football. Um, and we've done sort of, um, uh, and and the next field trip will be. Would be a field trip to Morocco in, in May, where um, where Yana uh, Wadabutik, our um, one of our team members, uh, is is based at the university in uh, in Rabat. Um, so, um, what did we do in uh, in uh, during our time in uh, in in Qatar? This is uh, Doug Tuasta, one of one of three members who uh, of, of the group who did research. He's pointing the, the directions here. Um, we did field observations from four group stage matches between the 23rd and the 30th of November. Um, uh, the first game was Wales against Iran. The second one was Poland against Saudi Arabia. Then we also did observations in al uh, for the game between Spain and Germany and also at the 974 stadium, uh, Brazil against uh, Switzerland. So those were the four matches we attended. Um, apart from that, we also did daily observations and interacted and talked with uh, fans from all over the world, really, at the fan festival in, in the Albida Park and also other re relevant locations in Doha. So the main topics we um, went out with and what we were looking for, in a way, we, uh, we tried to keep a, 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 an open uh, view on, on, uh, on events as, as possible and activities. Um, we were looking at, you know, possible, um, you know, this is more overarching. So when you're there doing, doing, doing field work, um, um, of course, um, you're mostly focused on, on the, on the, on the empirical side of things. Um, but we also had sort of these more theoretical questions. Uh, at the back of our minds, you know, how would, you know, uh, 
Uh, what about issues of security and uh, safety uh, of, of fans and spectators and visiting visitors during the World Cup? So, of course, this was a major event for, for Qatar, which is never happened before in, 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 the, in a small country like this. So, the challenges were many. So, we were curious to, you know, how would this play out with regards to different football cultures from all over the world? or people with a different football cultural background from all over the world meeting uh, at this event in uh, uh, in Qatar. Right. Uh, the rhetorics, I'm sure uh, a lot of you are, are familiar with that. Uh, uh, I come from a northern European country, and uh, a lot of the rhetorics and press coverage, media coverage, the years and, and, the, and the time preceding uh, the, the World Cup was pretty negative. And, um, and uh, there were many calls for boycott um, based on stories about the conditions of migrant workers, et cetera, uh, stories that you all heard about and you probably also know about from, from a Northern European perspective. It, it, it's been quite massive. And it's, it's tempting to say that it's been difficult to ask <laughs> questions about this quite um, you know, quite one di dimensional and very <coughs> unison uh, critique. Um, so this is just some examples, but all, even when Qatar was aw awarded the, the World Cup, uh, that's when it all started. And this is uh, this is a, a coverage, you know, how the Guardian, uh, a liberal British uh, newspaper, uh, covered the when when you know co covered the um, the events surrounding, you know, the the uh, allocation of the 2022 World Cup to Qatar in 2010. So it's we've we've had this rhetoric around uh, Qatar, which has been mostly negative, really, because no one understood. Uh, <coughs> many people didn't understand what was um, how Qatar could 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 get the winning bid, um, and. If I'm going to speak analytically, I'm, I'm coming back to that later. Uh, it's, it's there's a lot of things going on. I'm I'm not going into any great depth uh, into that, but of course it's it, it's um, tempting to use, um, and and we will in our uh, subsequent work. We are working with. I'm working on an article where I compare, you know, events. You know, um, two mega events from France. I did observations as part of my PhD, uh, the World Cup in France in '98, and and this World Cup, and concepts such as uh, <coughs> Orientalism, which you, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the concept invented by Edward Said back in the late 70s, will be used in order to analyze these, uh, this uh, media coverage, um, uh, which a lot of people, are, other people are also, also doing, of course, uh, at different levels. It's going to be a huge issue, I think, in, in, in the future, you know, how um, in among researchers uh, in different places, how how uh, the Qatar World Cup was covered um, in the Western or, or predominantly Northern European or and Northern American uh, press. So the, these were the issues. These are uh, different uh, media coverages of um, uh, from Norwegian media. Uh, this is from 2015. Uh, where some journalists have been visiting um, migrant workers working on the con construction sites. And the issue has always been human rights related and, and what were the conditions they were working under. Were they slaves under the kafala system of, of the companies that were employed, etc. So a lot of negative, basically, um, coverage. The rights of LGBT plus people has been also an issue in uh, in uh, mostly Northern European, but you know, European and, and also American media. Um, and then, as we are approaching the uh, the World Cup itself, the news of the fake fans came through, uh, and uh, <laughs> it was quite quite bizarre uh, the way it, w it was presented. And and this was particularly in in the Wikimedia, media, this was presented as a as a confirmation that. You know, Qatar completely lack culture. How can you be Indian and support Argentina, for instance? And and this image was sort of 
we we were sort of equipped with all these images and and, and very um, strong messages from from people uh, who boycotted. I I I know people. You know, everyone here know knew someone who said they wouldn't watch a minute of of, of the of the World Cup in Qatar. So we try to you know distance ourselves from that and you know as trying to be good anthropologists and see things from a native's point of view and and also take a crit more critical uh, aspect. Who are these fake fans? You know, you have to be uh, curious and, and uh, critical also to to the luggage you are carrying with you um, into the field. So, uh, and, the, and the last one was um, the ban on alcohol outside stadiums. And you could say that you know, in in uh, in Europe and in America, uh, South America, beer culture or alcohol culture is or alcohol is part of is, is a, seen as a as a vital part of of going to games and socializing with with people. So the ban on alcohol was also you know added, which was imposed shortly before the World Cup was was seen as as another example of that. This is uh, this is alien to us. You know, of course we are, but then. Um, as, as I shall, shall get back to, uh, it's not really that radical. You, there's very few stadiums where you can drink in and inside uh, the stadiums or outside the stadiums. Um, it's common in Germany and in Belgium. In Norway, there's there's no, for instance, no alcohol served uh, outside stadiums at normal games. So people are used to go to a cafe or a, or a pub to have a to meet friends and and, uh, and have a drink before. But this was all things that sort of contributed to the to the um, uh, to the whole contested uh, contestedness around around the uh, World Cup in Qatar. So this is very much some preliminary findings, um, work in progress. I'll just take you through some slides uh, based on our conversa conversations and, and 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 interactions with with fans we met from really all over. All over the world. Um, when we got there, of course, there were football references everywhere. Uh, in Qatar, when we went to games and walked in the streets, we we stayed. We were based in the old airport district in a in a you know among a lot of uh, migrant workers. We discovered a whole micro economy there uh, with cheaper restaurants and and uh, affordable affordable houses, which sort of added an uh, an interesting dimension to to our stay we we met other people than we would have met if we had stayed in in one of the big hotels in west bay or or downtown doha um yeah so references were everywhere where i love to go for a swim so i went to qatar beach um, um and there were works of art there and everything reminded you you know this is and a mega event for the world, but it was a, a mega event for Qatar as well. So obviously, you know, the, all the all the signs of um, you know how important this was for the for for Qatar as a host nation was evident everywhere. So this is some something we you know what happened there while we were there. Of course, we were part of the World Cup, but uh, I've been to Doha early, previously and. Uh, and the, the place looked totally different uh, during the World Cup. So in the Metro, this is us on the way to the game against Poland versus Saudi Arabia at the Education City Stadium. Um, so one of the first findings we, we realized, we, I've, I've, I've never witnessed uh, fans as loud as the Saudis, uh, I must admit. I've been to quite a few games uh, in, my, in my life, but uh, uh, the noise that the Saudis created at uh, Education City Stadium was quite phenomenal. So just very briefly, um, and then the other imp another impression was that the World Cup was dominated by fans from Asia and South America. We met Mexicans everywhere, um, and someone said that there was seventy thousand Mexicans there. And um, well, with Africans and Europeans maybe in a in a, in a third third place. And the Mexicans, they always travel to, you know, they explain you know, they, uh, this group of gentlemen sitting here at the fan festival in, in, in Alpita Park. 
Uh, they explained to us, yes, they, they, they've been to every World Cup. Uh, they go wherever Mexico play. They know they get knocked out early, but they still go to the World Cup with, because this is something they, they don't want to miss. It's, it's the biggest carnival, if you like, that they uh, like to participate in. Um, and and there were, there's been a lot of talk, but you know, was this a World Cup only for the wealthy, you know, for the upper class or the upper middle class? Because it's quite expensive to travel to Qatar and also to pay for accommodation and, 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 and stay there. And we met one of these guys had sold his car in order to afford going. Uh, so um, I would say our impression was that, okay, you, you couldn't be poor and travel to, to, to Qatar. Uh, you would need a, need a proper job, but of, of course it's a, a question of priority. And if, if the World Cup is the most important thing in your life, then you'll, a lot of people will be able to afford it, of course. And then what about the fake fans? I mean, eh, because that was, of course, some of the images we, we left with and, and this accusations that all the fans were fake and the, and, and the events preceding the, the World Cup was obviously staged uh, with, with groups of, uh, of fans. But we met some, at the same festival, we met some, uh, uh, we met fans from all, all over, but particularly from Kerala. There were quite a few Indians from Kerala and Kerala is one of the, regions of India which in, in, in which football is just as big or maybe even more popular than, than cricket, one of the few areas of India uh, which has that. And, and, um, and we spoke to a guy who said, yeah, I've supported Argentina for 20 years, uh, so what's wrong with that? I mean, uh, India is, is no good. We're never going to compete in the European or in the uh, World Cup uh, in the foreseeable future. So, so of course, I support uh, Argentina and I have friends who support France and Germany or Brazil uh, and, 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 and other countries. So this puts a, a sort of whole, whole new perspective on, on, the, um, um, on, the, on the accusations about fake fans. And I, I've studied transnational identities in, in football previously. Um, and it's it's been sort of, um, but that has been exclusively with regards to club fans. So you have Norwegian supporting teams, football teams in the English Premier League, or uh, or you have also, but I've also done studies of fans elsewhere. You know, uh, from different parts of Europe supporting club teams in in different parts of in in, in another league, you know, abroad, so to speak. So uh, I was thinking, you know. This this looks very similar in a way, you know. And a weekend supporting Arsenal or Liverpool is, you know, maybe similar to, um, apart from the maybe lack of geographical, you know, physical uh, distance, uh, is similar to uh, someone from Kerala uh, supporting uh, supporting um, uh, Argentina. So it sort of put things uh, in a in a in a perspective. I would say the, the, the atmosphere at um, uh, both the fan festival, but really everywhere you went was, was one of carnival. And this was, you know, this is, you know, <laughs> stereotypical Mexicans um, uh, with a beer in their hand at the, at the festival. Uh, of course, beer with alcohol was served after seven o'clock in the Alvida Park, um, which in a way, we thought, uh, by hindsight, you know, the critique against um, no alcohol served be before seven was made sense. You know, who would, you know, would anyone profit from uh, from drinking beer with alcohol in the in the in the heat from one o'clock, for instance? Uh, certainly not the England fans. Uh, they would not. Uh, uh, the risk that they would not behave uh, in a in a in a good manner <laughs> would be. Maybe it was sensible. So, so the, the focus on uh, on alcohol and drinking uh, became a bit bizarre once you're there and you see that the carnival is unfolding regardless uh, in, a, in a very friendly and very inclusive manner with, uh, in a place where also you know, families could, could, could enjoy their time. The other thing is that, I mean, I've, I've done a quite a number of um, fan studies um, earlier from, you know, back in the 90s. 
And uh, violence has always been an issue, either threats of violence or real violence, which I've witnessed on a number of occasions, um, or clashes between rival clans. It's not necessarily dangerous for outsiders because it's almost like, you know, a risk sport. You know, they, but but it's unacceptable for you know for a community to to have that. So. Um, and then, and then, as a response to that, you also have police violence. You know, police behaving unnecessarily uh, harsh and, and, and brutal. I've experienced that in Spain and, and also uh, uh, also in France on, on, on several occasions. Uh, so it's and, and that was one of the striking things, the striking observations that there were no police or stop, violence. Stop I mean, hands. It, it, I apologize for interrupting you, but uh, we have one minute to, what about Qatari fans? We spoke about all nationalities except Qatari fans. Do you have anything to say about that? Not, uh, not necessarily. Okay, I have one minute to finish. One minute. Please, we'd like you to talk about Qatari fans, if you may, please. Yes, I mean, um, uh, we met fans from all over. We, we focused in the fan area. Uh, we spoke mostly with actually visiting fans. You know, how, how are they accommodated by the, by, the, by the host? So we didn't really speak so much with the Qatari fans. Um, we... we we focus sort of, I mean, it, it's, uh, but if, if I could sh could say something, we, um, and they, uh, as I said, it's it's work in progress. We we will do an interview because I met an Indian guy who, who was behind the QFoot live blog, as some of you might know, uh, Ahmed Hashimi, who's, who's um, um, yeah, so, so and, and he's, he's going to, uh, we'll, we'll do an interview with him on, on the subject of uh, football culture in Qatar and the history of, of, of Qatar. So, but uh, if I only have a minute, I, I thought I had maybe 30 minutes to, to speak, but uh, if we, if, if, I, if I may finish with saying that this is, um, this is very much, uh, you know, work in progress. Um, um, and and um, we, we hope to do, you know, interviews about, you know, the, uh, Qatari fan with with Qatari fans as well. We because we also have some names with uh, Qatari ultras, for instance, um, which obviously is a great interest. But our focus has actually been on how did how did um, you know visiting fans experience the, the World Cup? And unfortunately, I, I'm not able to present any of <laughs> any of that now because my time has run out. So very sorry about that. It's it's uh, it's, uh, but we can maybe take it in the discussion if there are if there are some questions. On the contrary, we are very grateful. We know this is a working progress, and we look forward to that, and hope you'll have the opportunity. Thank you very much for being fair in your uh, presentation and. Uh, regarding hosting this with you are very accurate in the questions you mentioned you asked and the the slides we are happy that we you're still you haven't finished the the, the research project we hope you'll include qatari fans too now we move to joy rockwood and a visiting uh, fellow in sports marketing at the University of Vic Central, Catalonia, Spain. He has worked at 15 sports mega events in various capacities, including the last six FIFA Men's World Cups. He was a global columnist on a Japanese football website for a decade and has written for several media publications. He has produced numerous films amassing a combined 250,000 online views. His research interests include sports mega events, international development, the football industry, and sports governance, areas in which he has published widely. So please, John Rockwood, please, the floor is yours.
thank you uh, to Reem for the introduction and the hospitable welcome and for organising this event and to you all for joining us. On the plane journey over to Qatar, screens showed a now familiar QMB commercial. The football-fused advert makes no direct, direct reference to the recent World Cup, but Neymar is the star, and the child's narration calls viewers to imagine a spectacle where millions will come and the world is watching. The final line declares, imagine we're winning the hearts of the whole world. The bland production may lack authenticity, but the simple message clearly conveys the concept of soft power. It brought to mind this photograph that I took five miles from here four months ago during the World Cup. Different cultures sharing space, youthful imagination focused on a point of commonality, eyes fixed upon football. But using football to influence public opinion can incur challenges. Because soft power is not merely transactional. It is negotiated, nuanced, subject to interpretation. This visual presentation explores the correlation between soft power and disempowerment in the context of Qatar's football mega events. In Doha, of all places, Qatar needs no introduction, but as referenced in the opening remarks, any description of this country will usually reference its diminutive scale and also perhaps its significant wealth, its ratio of citizens to migrants. The reliance on a lucrative energy sector that depends on finite resources that can expose the state to economic shocks has fueled concerns for economic diversification. The national vision reflects and embraces core challenges constructed on pillars of development. It reveals environmental, human and cultural questions how to invest sustainably, how to manage migrant labour, how to modernise and preserve traditions. Moves towards peace building and international dialogue were halted when the Gulf became engulfed in a diplomatic crisis. Controversial and complicated, perhaps, for citizens of the GCC, but challenging too for Westerners attempting to navigate uh, geographical spaces and also political narratives. Contextualising its showpiece and intertwining sport with policy, Qatar staged over 500 sporting events before the World Cup. For Richard Giulianotti and others, international relations are often concerned with power and influence. Joseph Nye's familiar concepts of hard, smart and especially soft power have been applied to mega events as they are here. Influence through attraction or as the Qatar National Bank would have it, winning the hearts of the world. Rothman had previously created a continuum of power based on the tools deemed useful for implementing different degrees of soft and hard power. Here, I propose a continuum of soft power and disempowerment, where individuals may interpret or perceive events, circumstances or characteristics on sliding scales, perhaps from attractive to offensive. One's overall outlook may be formed, but often comprised of a myriad of micro-impressions, a dynamic model simplified here to convey the fluidity of soft power. Because mega events can be seen through different lenses, subject to varying interpretations. 
For hosts, they can incur costs, but also offer opportunities to showcase, to influence, returns on investment and evidence of impact can be harder to generate, to guarantee, and to demonstrate. To emphasize briefly my own experiences watching a lot of football in a lot of places, I attended 20 men's football events prior to a sixth World Cup in Qatar. But I reflect here on three football events. Qatar's 2011 Asian Cup, the 2019 Club World Cup, and of course, the 2022 World Cup. <coughs> In this visual presentation, I'll showcase images as photoethnography, with brief extracts primarily from World Cup interviews conducted with experienced fans at grounds like the iconic but sadly temporary Stadium 974 and accommodation like this fan village, both comprised of shipping containers. Participants were conscious of calls to boycott the event that Hans referred to earlier, and yet they traveled to Qatar anyway. Some had concerns, but were generally positive or at least open-minded about the prospect of Qatar hosting the World Cup. And the usual methodological disclaimers about the representativeness of this sample apply. The 2011 Asian Cup was hosted a month after it was announced that Qatar would stage the 2022 World Cup. The spotlight illuminated the potential, but also, at the time, a lack of infrastructure and questions over the long-term demand for the kind of facilities required to host FIFA's flagship event. Qatar was going to need a workforce and incur costs on unprecedented scales. Meanwhile, Russia was declared host of the 2018 World Cup on the same day, a country almost 1,500 times the size of Qatar. Acquiring the World Cup was a momentous statement of power for Qatar. But the FIFA scandals and associated allegations of corruption were also early indications of soft disempowerment. I took this photo after stepping off the plane in Doha in 2011. The airport poster conveys some interesting representations of participating nations. Some perhaps kinder and more accurate than others. The Qatari provides a nod to modernity. There is what might be framed as an ethnically ambiguous Australian, then relative newcomers to AFC, and a quarter are females. The tournament, however, was not particularly well attended, especially by international visitors. Although it was a reminder of the significant opportunities international sport can provide for political adversaries to face one another in more peaceful circumstances. The Jordanians offered some participatory fandom, examples of what Richard Giulianotti has termed carnivalesque behaviours, presenting a useful test of security and crowd management apparatus. And, of course, no alcohol was on sale, but few fans seemed to notice. Eight years later, the World Club Cup came to Qatar, and with it an opportunity to see what had changed. The Hamad International Airport had been built, awarded the world's best in 2021. A 37-station, 76-kilometre-long metro followed in 2019. There were 35,000 hotel beds by then, the majority catering for higher classes. As infrastructure developed, environmental questions and challenges followed. The fan experience had become a more pronounced priority across global sport. Interviewees spoke highly of the event as a spectacle. 
Criticism did surface about migrant worker conditions and the treatment of certain demographics. The state responded, declaring Qatar welcomes everyone. The significant increase in female fans moved to prove that point. Challenges had emerged both for seen and otherwise. In retrospect, we can say that the GCC crisis was at its midpoint in 2019, but at the time, it made travel in the region difficult, particularly for the South Americans, whose qualification is only confirmed a month before that tournament, giving less time to secure bookings. The venue changed from Education City to the Khalifa International Stadium just a fortnight before the event started. There were long post-match queues for metros as lines of communication and organisation were criticised. The site of building sites suggested Qatar wasn't quite ready for the World Cup at that stage, yet it provided a useful, if testing, experience for organisers. A global pandemic followed soon after, but the timing was perhaps kinder to Qatar than for some. The delayed Tokyo Olympics and Euro 2020 provided international observers with vital lessons for staging COVID secure sporting events. And with declining cases and established vaccine programs globally, Qatar's World Cup offered something of a fresh start for global sport. I'm not saying it was the beneficiary of COVID but it certainly wasn't its primary victim either. And now to the alcohol. The Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy declared alcohol is not part of our culture, but hospitality is. And the fan park in 2019 did offer perhaps the first opportunities for enclosed but open air consumption. Perhaps more significantly though, it was perceived to be a multicultural and authentic fan-focused experience. An interesting observation, particularly in light of the criticism surrounding the staged or fake fandom that Hans referred to in the first presentation. I've worked with some of the international collaborators and contributors of this Music Come Football Festival, including this interviewee. I make documentaries and videos primarily on my iPhone and my video from the 2019 events had 50,000 views on Twitter in the first week. Intended as an open representation of an event, it did also perhaps convey a positive impression of Qatar, which was well received, particularly if you support the winning team, I say as a man from Liverpool. The eagerly anticipated World Cup had a difficult start. Before a ball was kicked, Western TV presenters declared it the most controversial World Cup in history, citing the treatment on deaths of migrant workers. Journalists complained of filming restrictions. Some games had empty seats, whilst some attendance figures may have exceeded stated capacities and Argentina lost to Saudi Arabia. Some seats remained empty as spare tickets were not easily transferable. The electronic access systems that have or will become established practice were unfamiliar for many and relied on internet connectivity. As this interviewee argued, next came the turnstile test of whether clothes were deemed culturally compliant. Garments displaying support for women's or gay rights were not permitted. One Englishman had to remove his NHS t-shirt because it featured the rainbow logo, a symbol also co-opted by supporters of the National Health Service personnel during the height of the COVID pandemic. Despite polite pleas, the argument and nuance was lost on the stadium security, and perhaps understandably so. 
The World Cup had its cultures of complaint and its politics of protest. Support for the Palestinian cause was considered perhaps a safer expression than some other movements. For some, the events pitted Eastern traditions against Western values. But the previous summer's European Championships had arguably done so to greater extremes, with the added contextual tension of support for and resistance to the Black Lives Matter movement. Those from Munich, Amsterdam and Copenhagen were framed against equivalents from Budapest, Baku and St. Petersburg. Qatar's World Cup was not so much a cultural clash between continents, but it did bring to question the notion of global culture, the plausibility of universal values, the compatibility of differing cultural, religious and value systems, the multitude of modernities referred to in the opening remarks, and whether the challenge raised in the national vision presents a choice between modernization or the preservation of tradition. That would seem a defeatist and limiting view. It is, however, a question for Qatar and Qataris to consider. A national vision conveys how a country views and portrays itself. There have been stated improvements in migrant worker conditions, but for some, the state remains connected to such criticism and corruption allegations. Given the fluidities of soft power, detachment may take some time. For many outsiders, Qatar presents a soft introduction to the Gulf region and to the Middle East. For a small nation, there are cultural offerings and activities. The new Katara cultural village may not present a site of historical significance necessarily, but it does offer some insight into Qatari culture. And as Barcelona discovered when they hosted the 1992 Olympics, creating cultural sites adjacent to a beach will often prove popular with tourists. The normalization of regional relations and the opening of access to neighboring countries were important developments. I made a last minute decision to spend two days in Saudi Arabia during my World Cup trip, watching one of their games there. An excursion which would simply not have been permitted just a few years ago. Some benefits were shared across the region. As this interviewee argues, 2022 was perceived and received as a diverse World Cup. Asia's only previous edition was co-hosted by Japan and South Korea, who themselves have complicated relations. Both initially submitted individual bids before FIFA brokered a deal to share the event. Some suggested the 2022 tournament could or even should have been shared with a nearby state thus spreading the expense and the benefits. But such an idea never seemed likely. What was clear, even for outsiders, was how much it mattered to Qatar to be the ones to stage the Middle East's first World Cup. As for what comes next, one interviewee emphasised Qatar's sustainability challenge, as some legacies remain unwritten. Will stadiums be used? Was the expense justified? And if we could turn back time, would Qatar do it all again? Maintaining the pattern of event hosting, it was recently announced that Qatar will stage the 2023 Asian Cup, bringing this journey and this paper full circle. A glancing comparison of venues between events reveals total capacities will almost quadruple. This is capacity building. Ending on the only photo in this presentation that I did not take, this World Cup of endless narratives finally found its fairy tale ending. 
Messi's crowning moment surely settled this century's fundamental football debate. His PSG teammate, Kylian Mbappe, converted a penalty to add to his hat-trick, only for the reigning champions to lose the final. The Parisian club is owned, of course, by Qatar Sports Investments, who will have viewed the final, no doubt, as the perfect embodiment of their influence, justifying their investments, <laughs> a script they could not have written better themselves. Ultimately, Messi got the World Cup that he craved, and so too did Qatar. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Joel Rockwood, for your presentation. Uh, yes, this can be the subject of uh, criticisms. We thank you for providing the example that we can link what you said with the reality, and that is the QNB advert and thank you for mentioning Qatar National Vision 2030 which was part of your presentation uh, I, 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 I don't know whether Qatar has really managed 500 or hosted 500 events but thank you for saying that it's a fantastic achievement anyway and you talked about the security arrangements, uh, the impact of soft power. You also shed light. You said a very important sentence. I found that the, castle, the, the World Cup was not a confrontation between cultures, but uh, shed light on the diversity of cultures. You said that uh, previously there has been protests which some were of a peaceful nature, some were more confrontational, but luckily we didn't see much of that here. Now we open the floor for questions and answers, comments, if you have, on the two presentations. Um, my name is Jan Busse, Bundeswehr University Munich in Germany. And my question goes to Joel, um, because um, I'm interested in your conceptual approach. When you said, um, on the one hand, there is this idea of soft power, and you presented your own idea of soft disempowerment. And I was wondering, is it a continuum where, on the one hand, you have disempowerment, and on the other, soft power? Or is it rather two competing dynamics that are um, coexisting or coinciding? I would be curious about your assessment. Um, you could argue that it could be both. I, th I think there's more than one way to look at soft power. And I could quite easily have come up with a conceptualization more in keeping with what you've just suggested. Um, Soft power has been applied quite differently to sport from different angles. And quite often we look at concepts in relation to opposing ways of viewing. And I think it's legitimate to see soft disempowerment as contrasting to soft power. Um, but it's also possible to view them in parallel. So I. I take on board your, your comments. It's a conceptualization that I only perhaps formed in, in the field recently, and I would view it as a, a cognitive work in process, and thank you for allowing that journey to move forward in my own mind. Thank you. محفوظ عمارة من جامعة قطر لدي سؤالان سؤال إلى المتحدث الأول وسؤال المتحدث الثاني السؤال Hans, you know, through his field work, 
experience the notion of religiosity or spirituality or even the notion of dawa, if there was any notion of dawa during the FIFA World Cup, in maybe in a subtle way. And my other question to Joel, thank you for the presentation. Uh, did you feel that, I mean, the FIFA World Cup in Qatar was the same uh, as other World Cups or mega sports events in terms of um, it was not unique, it was just that you're producing the same kind of this ideal of uh, celebrating plurality uh, in a way, and maybe uh, FIFA can claim that it's one of the organizations that can uh, you know, realize and put um, together this notion of, uh, of uh, togetherness where maybe other systems are failing to do so. Thank you, Zoe. Um, um, Joel, can you start, please? Uh, now, you are, because you are here with us, can you please answer first? For, for the question, I, I would say that, that no World Cup is the same. And um, it was my sixth, but I, I met a man for whom it, it was his 11th, um, a German, far more experienced than a little... Uh, more senior in years than I, and I, you know, I asked him the same question. You know, when, when you meet people who've been to different World Cups, that's what you ask them. You, you talk, you share stories about different events, and, and you know, it is an opportunity always to learn about international communities um, from the host nation, but also of the, the people who travel. Um, you meet resourceful people, you meet hospitable people, and if we look at what's happened in the space following the previous World Cup and the sad events that have transpired in, in that country's relations with its neighbour. Um, I think that is the World Cup that will stand out in, in those terms. I think Qatar's World Cup has challenges in how it will be remembered and a lot will depend on what happens with the facilities that have been created. And there's big questions over this. But taking the World Cup to different continents is vital. I, I don't agree with everything FIFA do, but I like this policy. And my first World Cup was in Asia, and my last World Cup was in Asia. And they were very different events. And I'm writing a book at the moment. Um, it's a bit of a, a giving away a secret here, but it's called Football Cities. And it's based on different areas of the world where football has significance. And where you, where you sense the meaning of football to the people. And as I came from the airport and even drove here this morning, you're very well aware that there was a World Cup here. The signage is still evident. The shadows of the World Cup are still all around us. And I say that in positive terms. In, with due respect to Japan and South Korea, particularly in Japan, you could walk down the street where there was a stadium on and walk down the next street and not know there was a World Cup on. So I think... A World Cup that has an impact on place in, in infrastructure, but also in the development of sport, in sharing ideas is important. And, you know, overall, you know, positive impressions of Qatar were made by the majority of those, at least who I encountered, who were here. And um, I'm grateful for that. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Rockwood. Please, uh, can we just make sure that Mr. Hans is still with us? Naam, naam, ana ma'akum. Mr. Hans, did you understand, did you hear the question posed to you or not? Yes, I think you. Uh, I think so. Uh, and um, nice to see you again, Mahfoud. Uh, we, we met in, in Doha in December 2021. Uh, regarding your question, if I understood you correctly, it was about observations of, uh, you know, people's uh, religious, uh, you know, uh, life and, and, you know, in, and, and whether we made observations of, um, of religious references in subtle ways. Obviously, uh, this was one of the things that we set out to, you know, observe, basically, you know, how important is... Uh, religion in in the lives of you know spectators locally, but also 
uh, visiting fans from obviously the, the Middle East region predominantly. Obviously, the, the prayer rooms and stadiums was uh, something we looked up when, when we were in, in different stadiums. Uh, maybe one of the things we were looking for, whether the, uh, regarding the you know the female representation, was that is there a, is there a prayer room for for females? We couldn't find it in the in the stadiums, but maybe this was facilitated elsewhere. This is one of the things that you know it's work in progress. I haven't been able to find out yet. Maybe you could uh, clarify, uh, Mahfoud. Um, other than that, we did have conversations with uh, you know people of different. You know, who participated with different, should I say, intensity in their religious life, you know, with regarding to football. We met uh, a doctor who was uh, worked as a volunteer at the, at the festival area. He uh, was originally from Iraq, educated in Manchester, but worked at a hospital in, in Doha. Uh, he was very, he pre presented himself as a, as, a, as a very dedicated Muslim um, uh, who prayed at least five times a day. and. And, and related, you know, the the uh, the act of being a good Muslim to uh, to being a good fellow human being. So uh, and seeing, and he was obviously seeing this as as part of connecting people rather than you know forcing uh, either a faith or uh, a distinct a distinct culture on on other people. So it was. Yeah, uh, and this is one of the things I, I didn't manage to uh, touch upon in my presentation, which originally was part of it, which which is a cross cultural analysis because we we're also looking at how, you know, um, what what you could call sort of pietist Protestant, you know, um, uh, communities in in and congregations in our part of the world, particularly in certain parts of Norway, where you can we can identify with that attitude. Uh, part of the purpose of being religious is to be a good fellow human being. I'm not sure if I replied in any satisfactory sense to you, to your question, Mavor, but, but uh, hopefully I did. Thank you, Mr. Hans. Before we close the session, we take one last question, please. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you to the presenters. My question to Dr. Joel Rockwood. My name is Dr. Bushra. Mr. Rockwood, in your presentation said that you attended the World Cup as a researcher and as a writer, and you have experienced different ways of people uh, presenting them themselves and uh, and also you you mentioned the use of uh, your mobile phone and maybe some other people who did that and this was shown and like you got 50,000 views when you decided to make this video did you want to be an objective uh, researcher or you just made it as uh, an observer as a spectator or a fan covered with feelings and overwhelmed by your feelings attending such a mega event that's an excellent question and <clears throat> my interest and i suppose ways of looking at the world and and engaging in sports oscillate between the, the journalistic and the academic. And I, I like the strengths of both and um, get frustrated by the limitations of, of both as well. And I, I wouldn't suggest that, that making films on, on an iPhone is, is any way objective. I, when you make a decision to point a camera over here, you make a decision to consciously overlook what's going on over here. So that representation, that framing of an event seen through the personal lens is something that I, I like to reflect upon. Um, I am a very, very visual presenter. We all teach students, those of us who are academics, and you know what it's like to have students in front of you who are maybe not had enough sleep. So sometimes the visual engagements are, are important, and I, I like to show documentaries in class, and it's 
a bit more interesting to show videos that you've made rather than lazily putting on another YouTube video. Um, but I suppose that I almost try and treat the, the journalistic and the, the academic, if I can frame them as, as differentially as that, um, quite separately. I'm, I'm aware that there are particular expectations of, of, of academic uh, rigour and when I present at conferences I, I don't typically share videos but it, it's also a, a way of, of engaging. We talk about the impact of our, of our research and, and engaging with audiences beyond the academic and I think that's an important measure to consider and I certainly find videos a, a useful tool in order to do that. It's also, by the way, far more accessible. Um, the problems that some journalists had with, with being restricted on, on what they were filming and where, which I don't comment on as someone who's certainly not an expert in, in Qatari customs or um, security apparatus, but having something this size will very rarely get you in trouble compared to something the size of the camera pointing at me from the back. So it yields possibilities as well as problems. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much for your question, Dr. Bushra, and thank you, Mr. Rockwood. You managed really to attract our attention throughout your presentation. Before we close this session, we want to say that the third session, it has a paper uh, which will be presented by Dr. Abdurrahman al Hilli, which will pertain to the religious aspects. And Dr. Aisha al Basri will be moderating the next session. Thank you, Mr. Rockwood, and thank you, Mr. Hans. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.